Quixote. My middle name is Radio, and my last name is Vasilakis. Um, I am uh, a lecturer in the philosophy department at Brooklyn College, and um, I'm, I've also uh, worked as a lecturer at the English department at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. Um, and uh, I am finishing my master's degree at the liberal studies program at the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, and I'm writing my uh, master's thesis on uh, Hannah Arendt. And I'm focusing on uh, questions of political aesthetics in her work. Um, on the side, I uh, am a musician. Uh, I write poetry. Um, and uh, that's me. Hannah Arendt was a German Jewish uh, political thinker, uh, philosopher, journalist, teacher. Uh, she was born in Germany in 1906 and uh, died in New York City in 1975, I believe. Oh. And she had a very storied life. She um, grew up, uh, studied, and had an affair with Martin Heidegger, one of the famous um, 20th century intellectuals. Uh, and um, she is probably best known today for her work on totalitarianism and, uh, uh, and sort of the, the most dangerous forms of political organizations. Wow. So she lives with, through both wars. That uh, makes sense that she would want to dive into that topic. I know. Wow. How could you not? Yeah, with that, that life. So for, for my end of things, um, as the curator for a physical space that no one can go to for a while, I am in this position of thinking, you know, racking my brain trying to think of well, what can I do? How can I help? what can I put into the world that's actually useful that isn't compromised by its medium. Um, and so I'm really grateful that um, people like you have been willing to sit down and talk to me. So thanks. <laughs> okay, so Popsy topic is art as cognition. What do you think about art as cognition? It's a very broad general idea. So is there something in particular in that world that you would want to talk about? Well, d frankly, when I when I saw that, um, that topic, my initial reaction was, was, hey, hang on, there's a tension between art and cognition. Art, we think of as an imaginary an imaginative, creative, emotional, uh, feelings-based enterprise and cognition can be creative but we think of it as something abstract dealing with uh, you know I can't remember which side of the brain the right side of the brain which ones I think that's been proven to not really be true anyway there yeah. is no that's why I there didn't is remember. no delineation between <laughs> uh, abstract thinking and linear thinking it by side by sides. Got it's it. Like frontal. Uh, you know what? I'm not even gonna pretend. No, no, like that makes that's sense. Major. That makes sense. Like cortex versus amygdala or something. Yeah. So, so exactly, exactly. We but we tend we 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 retain this this notion. I guess counter to the science that cognition is distinct from art because it is somehow abstract, somehow general. And I think that that, uh, that tension was the first bit to hit me. Is that something that you think or is that, are you saying that that's a perception or both? Well, I, 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 I think um, that's certainly my immediate un unmediated reaction is that these are two distinct things 
and I, I, I take it to be that my immediate reaction is probably shared by a lot of other people. Like I, I'm not that different than most others. So I'm, I'm assuming that, um, the, that, that that's the case. And I think that that, um, that tension is probably what is, what is driving this, this topic in some sense, hmm. perhaps. Um, partly because thinking about or dealing with those tensions can be productive. Uh, and sometimes the areas of friction point, point us towards, you know, the discovery of something significant. I guess I'm biased because I make art and I, well, you're a musician, right? So there's dip. Well, okay. So there's different ways of making there's some, there's a more intuitive way of making in which case, sure, maybe that's not technically cognition, although I would argue it probably still is some version of cognition, but then there's intentional making, which is, you know, you, it's no different than writing a paper or anything else where there is still linear thought involved in the outcome of that thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's the thing itself that you made. So the making of the thing and then the thing itself that you made is a communication in some form. And the job of that thing is to find another brain to, you know, communicate those ideas to, and then that person has a thought about it. Um, I, I, I am I am a musician. I do play music, and uh, in particular, I think of myself as a songwriter and a composer of songs and lyrics. And I I, I really agree with you, and I think it's an important distinction to separate the process of making from the product of that process. And I think. Um, that the way we talk about art as cognition will differ from when we talk about the process and the product. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I, uh, I find when I am making or producing something that there are cognitive moments in that I will think abstractly about song structure or I'll go off into another um, musician piece like how did they put their piece together uh, but then when I'm making the, the stuff it feels very like a basic it feels very like materiality like we're oh we we, we I, I heard you speak about materiality uh, in fact just thinking about that um, yesterday on your um, Instagram live conversation and and I, I really feel that 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 spoke to me because my experience in making something feels very hands-on. I'm kind of working with rough material, and then that production of, of the, of the of the art piece. And and I think that that it's true that those do involve cognition, um, in the sense that you have to have these ab these like higher level planning for what you make and then once you produce that project or that item other people have their viewpoints changed and i think right i think what's interesting to me is that maybe we have different understandings or different concepts of what cognition is in the first place yeah. and i might be coming at it from uh, a different position that yeah, it has a different view. So. Well, I come at it from, so originally when I was in undergrad, I was going to school to be a teacher. I wanted to be a high school art teacher. Mm. And I did three years uh, as an education major. And I took my praxis um, and I learned all about how people learn. And actually that was, I didn't, I didn't know I was dyslexic until I was learning about dyslexia, oh um, learning differences in the classroom, um, public school. Wow. <laughs> like... 
what was my point? Oh, cognition. So when yeah, I think yeah. of cognition, I think of the five senses because that's how people learn. So yeah, so my understanding of cognition is from sort of that connecting point where it's connected to learning, I guess, which that's kind of what you're doing when you're both making and absorbing the work of others, you know, making your own thing and absor absorbing the work of other people is that you're hope, hopefully you're learning something, even if it's just like decoding whatever it is that they're trying to say. Oh, fascinating. I think a lot of times we have this sort of narrow idea of language that, and then cognition is sort of tied to that narrow understanding of language. But one of the really cool things about creativity and art is that it is beyond language. Mm. This is so interesting to me because the, our, our different backgrounds have given us different um, kind of layouts of what that mental structure looks like or how to parse it, you know, like different fields or different tasks will take the same basic thing and, you know, find different affordances in it to use. Yeah. And it's so interesting because from my background, I think of that five senses input as a kind of experience or imagination. And then those experiences or imagination, the things that we have like sensory images and experiences of the world can then be worked on in different ways and what i think of as cognition is a very particular kind of working on those immediate sensations that's distinct yeah. from something like let's say thought um, or even understanding which have very different operations on those like basic levels and none of this I don't think would be all that tremendously useful in like designing. Maybe it would be an, an education thing, but for for me, that's how I think of it. And I guess when people make art or when people are art making in that framework, I, I almost feel like they're what they're doing is rearranging those sensory images into kind of more coherent pictures that can then act as a guide for the art making process in mm -hmm. a sense and that cognition would be almost wholly unrelated to that process insofar as it's like this in in my in my worldview just happens right it's like this this numbers capacity this like it's, i think Hobbes says a reckoning of consequences which is like very purposeful and has an intended goal. And, um, you know, it's to produce an equation or, uh, uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's so interesting to me. And I guess it would be that difference in how we approach things is, is useful to others to, to see that difference in action. Yeah. I think you're right in that the sensory input is like the scaffolding to cognition if that makes sense mm -hmm. because you're right when when i'm thinking of it in those terms i'm thinking of it within the context of a classroom so you're set up to be there to be decoding information it, it when i when i think about this phrase art is cognition i almost think of like i think this is what you were saying with like the final project product you saying project will change someone's viewpoint and I feel like it's almost art for cognition or art as a, as a kind of rearranging that basic sensory input in such a way that allows us to then reckon with the world in a different way. I, I It almost seems that I feel mm -hmm. that art supplies cognition and our thinking with the material that it needs to draw sound conclusions about other people and other and human experiences. Yeah, I think that's fair. But then there's also um, contemporary art that is not concerned with a product at all, 
the art is a thought. And so originally when I read that, I immediately thought of like Alan Capro or Saul Louet or these contemporary artists that had such a brilliant idea that the end result can be repeated by anybody it's because they relinquish ownership and the end product is besides the point almost mm -hmm. because they wanted to take the aesthetics sort of out of the equation and bring you know more higher thinking into their work so trying to elevate in their opinion elevate yeah um art to be something that cannot be consumable mm. and that cannot be owned. That's interesting. It's funny because I thought of, for some reason, um, I, I don't know the artist that you were mentioning, but I thought of um, Virgil Abloh, the the guy behind Off-White. It's oh. like a sneaker brand and like streetwear stuff. He's like kind of was associated with Kanye West and he's like the lead director of Louis Vuitton or something. And his he his art is is uh, almost it's like somehow what you were talking about reminded me of that I think because there's a kind of um, a transparency in the product that is the kind of atmosphere or idea that the artist is making or a kind of a moment or a scene or or even a zone of possibility and mm. I love that idea of art as as providing a space or uh, an area for us to have cognition, for us to think, to act in different ways. And yeah. I feel like that's a that's a power of this kind of thing that you're talking about. I mean, I think we're doing it right now. Yeah. This, we're, <laughs> yeah. doing, we're making someone else's art right now, someone else's conceptual art project right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the extent, the extent to which we're, our perceptions are fooled is like very disturbing to me. This, what, what is the, I'm curious to ask you from your, your, your perspective as an artist, what the, you, this language of coding is interesting to me and that you would decode and that the piece's difficulty is based on its coding. And I, I'm wondering what kind of, how is that resistance i like that it's framed in, in this like resistance to the market what are some what what's a, an example or something uh when i used to teach studio art courses um when i would teach freshmen i would say okay so you're learning a new language basically you're learning a visual language because i oh. taught visual art courses and visual language starts with basic human understanding and it's and it starts with understanding how your body communicates information um so basically if you think of a painting as the remnants of someone's physical actions mm -hmm. you start to understand that the way your hand is moving across the surface is it's communicating an emotion because we just as empathetic creatures we understand what that hand did to make that line like this like this is a more careful measured line yes. that reads as slow this is a faster sort of blurrier line and mm. so speed you know you you imagine the person making the mark and you put yourself in their shoes so mark making um is like one of the first things that students learn the more expanded your vocabulary is in just mark making the more tools you have in your toolbox to articulate the huge variety of human emotion that people experience and then the collection of that it's like chords higher up chords have a totally different um they elicit different emotions than the lower lower chords you know they make us feel very different things so we're like um you know your eyes are actually vibrating when they look at colors and your body is actually vibrating in response to music mm. your eyes vibrate to color yeah unbelievable yeah. that's unbelievable. why certain complementary colors 
like red and green. If you imagine, actually, let's do it. Now it's my turn to do a thought experiment. Am I imagining that it's no, it's really like, am I just like, so what's happening in this image is these colors are close enough in saturation to each other um, and different enough in hue from each other that your eyeballs are literally vibrating inside your skull <laughs> when wow. you look at this. That is bananas. Um, and then the combination of that with the way the lines are receding in space plays with our understanding of space. So it's giving the illusion that something is going back in space or coming out at you. That's kind of upending my, my idea of light and color, which seems totally immaterial and not at all like capable of producing vibrations in my eyes. But when I, so when I look at that, I think I hear music when I see uh, simpler graphics like that. And Ooh. when I look at that, I hear like the highest strings on the guitar, like plinking. Wow. Wow. It's really? Uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, but it's still melodic. Yeah. You know? Wow. So what, what's the, what's the, What's the bridge there that that what 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 makes you think about music when you see those colors? Well, actually, the terminology in art is very similar to terminology in music. So those are high key, which means that on the scale of light to dark, they're up higher towards white and they're high in saturation. So if you think of saturation as loud or or loud or, loud or quiet. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then high pitch, low pitch. It's basically measured according to the same general rubric, which is according to how we sense things. Fascinating. There's a real like uh, um, close, like isometric almost overlay between music theory and and um, and uh, and art and visual theories of perception that's fascinating yeah because both of those things are the taxonomy of those things is according to human beings as the measuring instrument yes, yes. Right? so whatever yeah. is comfortable for us to look at makes us feel good and whatever starts to be uncomfortable starts to create tension and and then we decide you know what what the boundaries are based on basic human experience yeah, I guess I guess there's a real, you know, universality of human experience. Yeah, and that's kind of wonderful. Um, this talk of like of systems and and taxonomies makes me think about that moment when you're as a as an artist or a musician or something as when as a as a creator of some kind when you've intuited and when you've absorbed those systems or those technical systems in such a way that you don't have to think them anymore and yeah. you act them out and you can sort of think in like a vibe or an emotion like that's so interesting to me yeah it's like having a conversation right mm. like you master mm. um, i don't know if you speak any other languages but when i i grew up speaking Italian and I lost it over time because you know my my mom was going for her citizenship and she was like no more and then yeah. no practicing <laughs> yeah. anymore and now it's I still talk like I'm six years old when I mm. when I speak Italian and it's so hard to have a conversation on the level that I'm actually thinking at it's super frustrating and so that's how I think of what it what it's like when I remember what it's like to first learn that language, that taxonomy, it's like trying to hold a conversation when you barely have a grasp of the vocabulary. And then the more you master it, the more fluent you are. And then now, you know, then you can have really easy breezy conversations because like it's, it's, it's all at the tip of your tongue, you know? 
wow, you know, like the the Im- improvisation and jazz, you know, people are just, yeah. whoa, how, how? Jazz is, that's a great, that, those are conversations. They, they call and respond. That's a great example, yeah. I wonder if there's an art, like a visual art example of that. It's tricky with with you know with with the artist with a painter with a sculptor because the medium is so concrete. Yeah, I guess if I break down the idea of call and response with visual art, I think that's where the curator comes into play because that's mm-hmm. sort of the curator's job is to facilitate how the other is going to be able to absorb the intended information made by that artist. Yeah, I think that's where that comes in with like traditional visual art because there's tons of more conceptual art that's interactive. Mm, Um, mm, mm. And so there's a call and response in the way that they're asking the viewer to interact with it. Yeah. That's right. That that kind of makes me think again about the a space of possibility or a space of Foucault talks about art as uh, a space for uh, for freedom and for doing the the undefined work of freedom. And I feel like that's that's making me think of what you're saying that that the the curator and the artist puts and opens a space for that conversation to happen and for that unexpected and new arrangement of ideas to happen like it's a very different conversation you know it's it's almost for the spectators so it depends on how you treat it like there's this thing about if you hang if you have a painting and you hang it above 62 inches from to the center Mm then it's viewed as inaccessible because your eye level is below the center line. Wow. But if you take it below 62 inches to the center, then it reads as more accessible. It reads as something that you can get up closer to and um, spend more time in front of. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. It makes me, this makes me think of, um, I can't remember the name of the artist, a Brazilian artist, 20th century Brazilian artist did a, an installation piece at the Whitney, which I hope one day can return to when this quarantine ends, where they set up like some kind of jungle yeah. inside of the, the, the space. And it was like literally a raised mound of dirt with like a, a, an area you could take off your shoes and you could walk through it and you could kind of go in this like jungle space inside the Whitney. I didn't go in. I didn't take my shoes off. <laughs> I wish I did now, but I, I, I didn't. But it's, it, it makes me it makes me think of that, like the artist as, you know, the artist can make can make these choices about layout. Like you can decide or, or as a curator as well, you can decide where the piece sits how you interact with it and that all determines your your cognition yeah so hey you know right there yeah and then whatever piece that installation is next to is a whole nother conversation too if you're interested in continuing this conversation um about artist cognition you can sign up on the sign-in sheet um we're going to get some availability days and times and if uh, you have any questions, you feel free to email me, meltinggallery at uco.edu. Uh, and thanks for watching.